Okay, so without further ado, let me introduce uh, Devavrat Shah. Devavrat is a professor in the Department of Electrical, and Computer, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at MIT. Uh, he is the founding director of statistics and data science at uh, MIT. Uh, he's a member of IDSS, LIDS, CSAIL, and the OR Center. Uh, his current research interests include algorithms for machine learning, causal inference, and social data processing. And of course, he's also very well known for his earlier work in the area of uh, stochastic networks. He's received a number of uh, uh, best paper awards. And uh, like I mentioned for the speaker in the morning, it is very impressive that the breadth of uh, best paper awards that he has won from so many different societies uh, in form supplied property society, NeurIPS, ACM Sigmetrics, and IEEE Info Infocom. He's also received uh, uh, um, career awards for his young career. Uh, uh, he's uh, received the Erlang Prize from the Informs Applied Probability Society and the Rising Star Award from ACM Sigmetrics. And he's a distinguished young alumni of his alma mater, IIT Bombay. Uh, in addition to doing fantastic theoretical work that uh, many of us know, he also translates his theory to practice. He founded a startup called Select, which was acquired by Nike in 2019 and it helps retailers with optimizing inventory by accurate demand forecasting. Uh, so today he'll talk about this uh, really interesting idea called synthetic control and uh, uh, the role of tensor estimation in it. Go ahead, Devapra. Uh, thank you, Srikant, for a kind introduction. Uh, thank you, Srikant and Shankar, for first of all, um, uh, organizing and sort of supporting this workshop uh, and inviting Leigh and myself uh, to organize the meeting. Uh, Lee has been a terrific uh, co-organizer, so I think I will sign up to be his co-organizer for life in whatever he asks me to. Uh, at some level, uh, Lee contradicted himself by saying that uh, he's going to start the first talk at the low. Actually, he gave a terrific first talk, so I think the bar is too high, so maybe we'll go in the downward direction rather than upward. Uh, now, one of the interesting experiences we were organizing this uh, workshop was, uh, at least for me, for the first time it happened that we invited some amazing speakers and all the speakers immediately accepted to speak in the workshop. And uh, I mean, that's called, um, call it a luck or call it uh, uh, something else. And one can ask the question, why did that happen? Well, there, were, there are many reasons. Uh, maybe another question to ask is that would this have happened if it was non-COVID times and it was non-virtual? Maybe all of us would think that something different would have happened. Question is that how precisely? It's a very hard question to answer because in a sense, um, an event has happened, there is no alternative reality that we have observed and we want to say something about that alternative reality. That's exactly the counterfactual estimation or causal inference with observational study or observational data, uh, that's the field. And in a sense, uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is uh, a method of synthetic intervention, which is, as Srikant mentioned, uh, a synthetic control is a uh, generalization of synthetic control. And as, uh, as the presentation will progress, I'll make all of these terms clearer. Uh, so, if nothing else, for this one reason itself, uh, I hope you will find this talk to be pertinent in the uh, broader program of uh, this workshop. Uh, the presentation that I'm going to do today is primarily based on uh, thesis work of uh, two of the graduate students at MIT, Anish Agarwal and Dennis uh, Shen. It's also in, done in collaboration with Abdullah Alomar and Romain Kosman. All of them are uh, graduate students at MIT. Uh, so with that, uh, let me get started with one um, simple but useful uh, question. Again, pertinent to as we um, think about how does one design different types of policy interventions in the context of uh, COVID-19. And let me start with one uh, chart that all of us are very, very familiar with. So here uh, on, your, on the screen, what I'm plotting on x-axis is days and y-axis is number of deaths. Uh, zero is representing the day on which 80th death was reported in the United States because of COVID-19, okay? And of course, before that, uh, the number of deaths 
count was slowly increasing. And after that, the number of death count was increasing quite fast. And here, uh, what I'm plotting is simply outcomes that we know uh, in the first 15 days after that day zero. Okay. Now, as we looked at this, of course, there's a specific types of policy intervention that happened within the United States, and we all know about that. The question is that what was happening around the world? Well, in different parts of the world, different types of policies were implemented and that led to different impact. Now, one uh, lens from which we can sort of look at uh, different outcomes in terms of uh, or different policies is, let's look at the changes in mobility restriction or changes in mobility more precisely. So what do I mean by that? So let's imagine that before day zero, so in every country, there has been a day zero, day zero when uh, 80 deaths have been reported, before that uh, COVID was not prevalent and after that uh, COVID was. And so around that time, every country decided to intervene and decide to uh, implement different policy. That policy through uh, all sorts of knobs and levers led to a situation where mobility of people reduced. And if the mobility before and after that change or the difference between that is not much, I would call it low mobility restriction. That is, these are the countries in which policies were such that, that uh, it did not change people's uh, behavior in terms of their movement drastically. At least for first 15 days, United States would fall there. And other countries like France and Spain would fall there as well. Uh, then there was a, another group of countries where uh, the resulting uh, policies reduced mobility between 5 to 35 percent and a lot more closer to 30 percent or 20 percent or so. And those countries would include, uh, as you can see on the orange uh, bars, countries like Turkey, Switzerland and all. And again, this is all for the first 15 days only because different countries have gone through different interventions over course. So I'm just focusing on 15 days after day zero. And then the third group where there was severe mobility restriction, um, uh, some countries, for example, a uh, country where I grew up, India and uh, Pakistan and many others. Now, of course, scenario is very different right now because policies have changed drastically since the first 15 days. But this was the ground truth in the, those countries in the first 15 days. So there's a three different interventions that are playing out, at least when viewed in terms of how mobility or how movements of people have changed um, uh, through the policy intervention across the globe. And this was roughly uh, 25 or so countries out there. Okay. Now, one question that one can ask is that, well, what would United States have experienced if it had gone through different policies so that uh, either it had received low mobility restriction, which it did, it did, or maybe moderate mobility restriction or severe mobility restriction. Okay. And in particular, we would like to know this, not just uh, qualitatively, uh, I guess it may not be hard to believe that higher mobility restriction would have potentially led to uh, lesser uh, deaths or lesser rate at which deaths grew. Question is that how much precisely can we quantify that? And can we quantify that in the term, terms of trajectories uh, of the dead count? Okay. So that's a question that we would like to answer by looking at data within the United States as well as across the globe. Okay. Um, I will walk you through um, method uh, and the approach uh, through the rest of the presentation, uh, but here in a nutshell is what happens to the United States when we apply that method. Uh, in particular, what this chart shows is as follows. On day zero, so we are sitting at day zero with the data up to day zero for United States and all other countries. Okay. And then we are trying to forecast or project what would happen to the United States under three different uh, restriction. The dashed blue line, dashed orange and dashed green lines are the projections for United States. For these projections from other countries, we will utilize information about what happens to them after day zero, but not for United States. So as we are projecting this information out for United States, we are not using any information about 
United States behavior after day zero, only before day zero. Okay. And uh, along with that, I'm superimposing what happens to United States um, uh, in reality. And as you can see, the, the dashed blue line and the dark blue line, which is the true outcome, are closely are close to each other, sort of giving a uh, cross-validation effect that, yeah, maybe this method is doing something all right. Okay. Uh, and one thing that sort of, uh, one can say is, well, what would happen to other countries? Well, United Kingdom, again, another country that went through low mobility restriction, again, for that, it ignored the what happens in future, but only using data till day zero and other countries' outcome. Uh, here are the three counterfactual predictions. Again, seems like a reasonable agreement. Uh, looking at intermediate uh, or moderate mobility restriction, there are two countries such as Brazil and Turkey, at least in the first 15 days. And this is what the outcome looks like. Again, there is some agreement and there is some disagreement there. And then finally, uh, for um, a severe mobility restriction, two examples are India and Ireland, and those are the counterfactuals. Okay. Coming back, to the full circle, if one were, uh, let's say if I were, uh, uh, I had in my power of, to make policy decisions, maybe at day zero, if I had these foresight, I would say maybe we should have a moderate, mo moderate but precise mobility restriction so that we follow the orange curve rather than the blue curve. And maybe we don't want to follow the green curve because it might have a severe uh, impact on the economy. Now, of course, there are lots of things that are out there that I'm not accounting for, but hopefully at least there's some uh, macro and somewhat precise information we can get out of these kind of analysis. And this presentation is primarily geared towards such analysis. Okay, so I see that there is one question in the chat uh, or maybe a comment. Uh, oh, I see, it's a Srikant's comment, so I'm going to uh, move on. Actually, it's a 15 minutes, so maybe a good place to Shrikant take uh, quick questions if anybody has. How do you account for governments lying about the data? Great, great point. Uh, so here, uh, so there are two answers. One is here, I'm, at some level, I'm assuming that the data may be noisy, but there is a true signal out there. And this is a noisy observation or ob observations with potentially missing data, and that's fine. But it's not uh, extremely engineered version, okay? So indeed, that is out of the scope other than the fact that maybe data might be noisy. I guess they were writing, go ahead, yeah. Okay, All right. So the question is that how, and that's basically uh, what I would call um, uh, a method to do causal inference using observational data and uh, specific method in this context, we'll discuss the synthetic interventions. Okay, so let's just um, uh, set the framework right, framework from the causal inferences uh, perspective. Again, the fundamental question in causal inference is you observe only one outcome. However, you want to know all possible outcomes or counterfactuals. And again, going back to the R example, we observe only outcome for United States under low mobility restriction, but we would like to know what happens in moderate or severe mobility restriction. Now, uh, there's a beautiful framework that's been uh, introduced since 1920s and uh, popularized by uh, Rubin and colleagues uh, since 1970s called potential outcome framework. So the basic idea is the following, that every unit, in this case country, has multiple latent states. Okay, uh, a latent state that's under uh, low mobility restriction, moderate mobility restriction, or high mobility restriction. Okay, and depending on which latent state that uh, unit is, uh, it would produce a different potential outcome. Okay, um, for example, I will represent uh, uh, this M of D as average or uh, expected potential outcome under intervention D, okay? And D would be different uh, policies, for example, low mobility restriction, moderate or high. Why D star is the observed intervention, 
Okay. And again, uh, the hope is that the true potential outcome is um, in expectation equals to what sort of uh, you would have observed if one would have sort of um, uh, intervened with the uh, intervention D star. And the goal is to estimate all potential outcomes under all put potential interventions from these observations. Okay, so again, different latent states, each latent state can lead to noisy observations from that. Of course, uh, each unit is only sort of uh, intervened with one um, uh, intervention. And for that intervention, we observe noisy uh, data. Okay. Now, one way to encode this is, I would, uh, I would argue that is uh, view this data as tensor. So why is this tensor? Well, let's look at this. So here I'm representing three order tensor. Uh, one of them is units. So this is where let's say countries. These are different interventions. There's a low mobility restriction, media, uh, moderate and high. And these are measurements, measurement across time. Okay. And in our case, measurements of the death outcomes. All right, so, so far so good. Uh, let's uh, look at um, our specific example of countries, policy, and days, in which case a specific observation, a specific observation here can be viewed as a, what happens to United States on day T if it had done nothing. And so this gray slice, for example, represents doing nothing. Uh, the blue slice may uh, do um, uh, moderate mobility restriction and whatnot. Uh, this is uh, USA under policy B on day T. Okay, now to evaluate these outcomes, which is what ultimate goal is, that is we want to understand what are the values in each of the, uh, each entry in the tensor. There are two primary approaches that uh, have been around. One is what I would call experimental studies. And another one is what I, I would call observational studies. Experimental studies is where uh, people do randomized control trial. That is, you take uh, a group of countries, let's say a group of countries, uh, 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 you know, okay, so let's do uh, first in the context of drug design as it's done in our city since 1940s, where you have a group of your patients or group of patients and you randomly choose uh, one set A and give drug A and randomly choose set B and give drug B just the way it's happening right now in uh, vaccine trials and then evaluate the impact of uh, the treatment on them and compare at the end of the day how, uh, how impactful whether uh, intervention A or B was. Okay. Here the nice thing that happens is that assignment of treatment to individuals is uh, not related to the outcomes associated with the individuals. And that's what's known as uh, unconfoundedness. The observational study as is in our setting, we are restricted to data that we observe. Okay. Ideally, for example, if you want to do randomized control trial in the specific case study we are discussing, what we would like to do is we would like to have three copies of United States. Copy one of United States having low mobility restriction, copy two having moderate, and copy three having uh, high mobility restriction. And for each one of them, we would let them evolve for 15 days and observe how the outcomes of death look like. Again, this is uh, impossible in this setting, and hence these are the type of scenarios where one would rely on observational studies uh, as we'll discuss here. Okay. So, um, just to going back to the tensor representation, how would that look like um, uh, for both of these scenarios? Well, here is a scenario where um, we have different patient types, we have different drugs, and we're measuring their out health outcomes across time. And in a sense, we are observing all of these outcomes. We observe all of these outcomes, and then at the end, we decide which drug is the best for all patients, and maybe averaged over all outcomes here, it seems this is the best compared to these two. Okay. On the other hand, if we might want to do a 
personalized drug design that is maybe patient type A, one drug, patient type B, one drug, and patient type C, one drug. Uh, type of question you might want to ask is that, is uh, how would patients in group G uh, react to drug B? And to answer this question, you might have to do a separate experiments for each one of the group and drug combination. And then based on that, we might decide the outcome. But it's possible that each group might get only one drug each because we have very few patients. Question is that from these kind of partial observation, can we still fill out? So in a sense, this is a randomized control. And from there, we're going from randomized control to a mixture of randomized control and experimental data. And we'll discuss some of these things as we go forward. Back to our example, what we have is there was a time zero or day zero when uh, what I would call COVID-19 outbreak. Before that, all countries didn't really implement any intervention and they were in pre-intervention or no intervention phase. Some countries, even after day zero, remain in non, uh, no intervention. Some countries did make some intervention and so on. And what we would have liked to do is that for each country under each intervention, what the outcome would be so that we could have decided uh, that which is the best policy, maybe in hindsight. Okay. So in short, um, what we are trying to do is we're trying to uh, complete this tensor by having a partial observation of it. Okay, and different sparsity patterns are determined by different types of studies we do randomized control or mixture of randomized control and observational or pure observational as we are seeing in this setting. Each one of them have different observational or sparsity pattern of tensor and we want to complete the tensor using uh, this setting. Okay. So that in a sense is what we would view as a formal question. So in summary, uh, the question is that what are the sparsity pattern that are allowed so that we have efficient algorithms that can allow us to do a meaningful counterfactual estimation. That's the question that we want to answer here. And for a specific class of factor models, which I would call tensor factor model, and introduce in a second, along with synthetic intervention algorithm, what we could argue is that indeed uh, counterfactuals can be estimated in a meaningful manner uh, using a computationally efficient algorithm. All right, so again, so if, uh, I think this is 10 more minutes, so maybe I'm going to continue unless somebody has a burning question. Right, so let's start with uh, setting with observational study. In particular, it's very relevant for policy evaluation type of question that we started uh, this presentation with. Okay, so, um, one of the key insights uh, in uh, this space, and this has been around for uh, at least empirically for a century and in a sense of methods, uh, especially in the world of econometricians, this has been around for uh, quite a few decades. Uh, and the key insight that comes from that field is the following, that look, I want to fill entries here, that is for a certain set of countries, under an intervention that I have not observed. Now, how do I do that? Well, one option is that look at the countries that are like you and that have had intervention that you care about. And then somehow extrapolate to fill this and this values. Okay, so just repeating, the key insight has been that, well, I'm a country uh, for which I have not observed the outcome under a green intervention. To fill these outcomes, what I would do is I will go and look at the other countries that look like me, and they have observations under the green intervention, and then use those observations to somehow extrapolate to fill what would have happened to me under green intervention. Okay, that has been the great key insight. Okay. Now the question is that, how do you learn the, such relationship? Well, one way to learn such relationship is to look at what happens to all countries under same intervention in this context, pre-intervention, when all the countries had no COVID-19 related policy intervention and look at some observations there and use those observations to learn relationship between them. Okay. 
And this is um, exactly uh, the essence of uh, many of the approaches uh, pre-synthetic control uh, in terms of what one would call matching units and so on. And it was beautifully formalized in this work by uh, my colleague here at MIT, Alberto Abadi, in his thesis in 2003. Uh, so what I will do next is uh, briefly explain uh, this method of synthetic control using these pictures. So I will not be fully precise, but hopefully communicate enough uh, ideas about the algorithm. So that sort of that gives you insight of sort of what's happening. Okay, so what is synthetic control and what was it trying to do? So synthetic control, again, in view of uh, this now tensor representation, was exactly trying to uh, fill in some entries of tensor, but it was a very specific way. So the interest in synthetic control was there was only one slice. Actually, it was more like a matrix. And what we want to do is that we have uh, one country. This is, let's say, United States. And we want to know what would have happened to United States if it did not do anything. But it turns out United States did something, not that it did do nothing, but assume that it did not do anything, then what would have happened to United States? Well, to do that, what would we would need is data from other countries before intervention or before COVID-19 outbreak when no country did anything, but also set of countries we did nothing. That is, there are other countries that did nothing and the way it would utilize this information in filling this question mark is as follows. You learn the model uh, using observations uh, from all the other countries before intervention and United States before intervention under doing nothing. Okay. And this is effectively uh, doing a variation of some form of linear regression. So visually, effectively, these are my features and this is my label. And then there are multiple observations I have across time. And then I'm trying to learn a linear relationship between these two things. That's my linear parameter. And this is what I would call the argument of this. Uh, here I'm effectively assuming this unique. So let's assume that for simplicity. That's my synthetic control, okay? And once I have learned this uh, control before intervention, I will look at all other countries' uh, observation under doing nothing and then forecast it to fill in this question mark. Okay. Now, of course, um, synthetic control comes with a little bit more than just what I have described, but in a sense, this is what it is. Now, just to add a little bit more, um, the synthetic control usually assumes that um, these Ws are non negative and they all add up to one to give the interpretation that uh, this is, um, for example, if the weight of United States was 80% Sweden and 20% uh, Netherlands, then it would say United States is like 80% Sweden and 20% uh, Netherlands. And there is a nice interpretation. So this is a uh, synthetic control. Now, uh, since I've explained an algorithm and with pictures, potentially if there are questions, uh, maybe I'm happy to sort of take them here and take a bit of a pause. Yeah, I have a question. So, so in the, do you choose the countries that are similar to the United States somehow, or do you choose all countries? I mean, I guess the more countries there are, there would be some uh, um, issue with sort of fitting, fitting a model to it. Uh, is, there, is there something that needs to be done that's sort of more of an art than a science, or is the, the science itself tell you how to, how to select the countries? Yeah. Beautiful question. So just to uh, paraphrase Srikant's question is that, uh, how do we decide which countries to choose here for uh, model learning? Um, uh, so um, in the original paper of Abadi et al, um, there was a part of the art where the idea would be that you would look at the set of countries, see to make sure that there is no interventions uh, happening in some latent form or in some observed sense. So that's one thing. Second thing is you might also want to uh, remove some of the data uh, if it's noisy, et cetera. Um, in a second, the method I'll discuss, um, what one would like to do is that as we look at this kind of a regression problem, we'd like to regularize it. And one way to regularize it is um, 
first denoise the data up front and then uh, um, doing um, uh, a sparse model learning. And that would naturally happen, uh, as I'll explain in a second. Uh, and that's at least a good data-driven method. But again, there's always an art element of art that comes into play. That is, more you remove the data that you think is not going to be useful, better it is. But of course, regularization is one way to address this problem. Thanks. Okay. Any other question? All right, so moving on. So uh, how does uh, synthetic intervention differ from synthetic control? Um, it's effectively the same, but there is an important and subtle difference. And I'll uh, explain that uh, through this picture. Okay, so first and foremost, synthetic intervention is trying to estimate counterfactual, not just in absence of actual active intervention, but also in presence of intervention. Putting it another way, synthetic control always try to assume that the thing that you want to uh, fill in is under status quo. But here we might want to fill in the information across different interventions, such as uh, information may be here, information may be here, information may be here, and so on. The second thing is, as I'm showing in the picture, it's not just about one country or one target as synthetic control would do, it's also about um, um, multiple targets simultaneously. Okay. So that's one thing that we want to do. So how would we go about doing that uh, using very similar approach as synthetic control? Well, again, in words, let's suppose that we want to fill in the entry here, which is what would happen to US's trajectory under low mobility restriction uh, after uh, this intervention, and we are observing uh, data across the country under no intervention setting. Well, here's what we'll do. As before, we'll try to learn the model using the data uh, pre-intervention. That is, here is the United States. Okay, here are the observations of United States uh, before any intervention. Now I have lots of countries, lots of countries that have uh, data available for them pre-intervention, but I'm going to only focus on those countries that after intervention have received this blue intervention that's of my interest okay so i'm simply going to focus on those countries and then using these as features and these as labels i'm going to try to learn just like synthetic control a linear relationship so i'm going to learn that linear relationship and then just like synthetic uh, control setting now i'm going to utilize the data from these countries to extrapolate what would happen to United States under the blue intervention. So again, the model that I'm using was learned using uh, pre-intervention data, that is data where no intervention was happening. And now I'm using the same model to extrapolate with the data that's about those donor countries, as I would call them, but under blue intervention. Um, uh, when I go, sorry, let me sort of erase this drawing to make sure that I don't confuse. When I go from um, uh, predicting this green instead of this blue, well, I will try to do the same program, but now I will utilize the countries that have received green interventions after time t0. Okay, and again, so I'll do the same thing. Now, uh, this is where I would um, um, make few remarks in terms of little differences in terms of uh, how one would learn this W, where we would not restrict it to be non-negative or sum up to one. Instead, what we will do is that we'll take the data here, which is pre-intervention, that along with post-intervention, we'll denoise it using uh, traditional matrix estimation method, uh, such as singular value thresholding. It's like effectively performing a principal component analysis on these pre-intervention data to denoise the data. That is, data might have missing values and noise. So this is something that will sort of denoise it. And after that, you do standard ordinary least squares. Because we are denoising in this form, effectively the uh, denoised observations or denoised features become uh, a low rank matrix and hence 
the resulting uh, model will be very sparse. Okay. This is also the classical principal component regression uh, method. So this enables um, uh, some of the robustness, robustness in terms of not need to sort of apply art or prior knowledge in terms of what donors to choose or what donors not to choose. Okay. So this is a primarily uh, the only difference that's there between uh, synthetic control and synthetic intervention. Again, uh, synthetic intervention is trying to um, uh, do counterfactual analysis in presence and absence of multiple interventions for all the units simultaneously. Uh, unlike synthetic control where it's only for absence and one unit. And second is it's not trying to restrict uh, to uh, non-negative uh, linear weights that add up to one, but it's doing uh, matrix uh, estimation based denoising upfront to provide the robust estimation to allow for sort of not need of uh, choosing the donor stuff here. All right, and uh, again, sort of one thing that has happened implicitly here is that we have transferred model that we learned in data for a gray intervention to blue or green in a somewhat shameless manner. So some of the questions that must arise is that, okay, first of all, why did synthetic control work? Or more importantly, why is this synthetic intervention style method work? Uh, when can we, in a data-driven manner, uh, argue that this might be a reasonable thing to do? What sorts of causal assumptions are we doing behind the scenes for these methods to work? These are all the questions that must arise. But before I go to them, uh, it'd be a good place to take a pause uh, because I'll explain all the algorithms and methods that uh, are there as far as uh, this presentation is concerned. Again, I have a question. Let me start off. Uh, yeah. Maybe I'm missing something. So, so before the COVID-19 breakout, you have, uh, uh, you know, you looked at all the countries and then you looked at the United States and maybe you're looking at the number of uh, uh, respiratory illnesses or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you try to draw, you try to get a, a relationship, a linear relationship possibly between what's happening in other countries in the United States. Yeah. Now, what I don't understand is that now that doesn't, and then now, now let's say you, you're trying to understand various scenarios. Let's say in the US, the, the amount of intervention is uh, rather small. Uh, um, and and, and uh, at this point, you're doing a matrix completion. Is that, that's where, that's the primary difference between synthetic control and synthetic intervention. So basically you're doing matrix completion to understand, because some countries have, different countries have uh, 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 imposed different types of restrictions. And the question is, uh, uh, you want to use matrix completion to figure out what would have happened in countries that did not impose the restriction? Is that, is that the, is that, is the one? Okay. So uh, there's uh, two parts. One is uh, the matrix uh, uh, estimation or completion part. Mm -hmm. And the second is the model transfer part. Okay. okay. So, uh, so let's look at this, uh, this picture itself. So first I want to learn, let's say the relationship beta Mm -hmm. relationship beta that I want to learn that says how can I sort of express the outcomes of United States as a linear function of outcomes of other countries but only those other countries that after intervention have received green intervention okay okay so I'm only going to first restrict to those countries once I have restricted to those countries I'm going to look at this matrix and I will denoise it using matrix estimation because there might be noisy data, missing values, and uh, just the data might be too high dimensional for the, uh, for the purpose. So I'm just going to do matrix estimation first. And after I did matrix estimation, then uh, let's call this as a matrix estimated matrix, let's call it Z hat. And then I'm going to learn this linear relationship. And then I will use that linear relationship, uh, look at this data, also matrix estimated, and then apply this beta hat to it. Now, this beta hat, let's call this beta hat green beta hat, because when I did this one, I must have learned some other beta hat that I was a beta hat blue one, which was between this and these countries. Okay. Okay, and so in a sense, these are the, two differences, that is we are, one is we, when we learned uh, the linear relationship, 
we denoise this matrix rather than restricting to be uh, some of uh, some of uh, parameters to be one and non-negative. And second is once we learn this, we are using them to extrapolate the green data in synthetic control. It, this would not be green data, but this would be only gray data. Ah, uh, okay. Because I learned relationship between uh, United States and other country when there was no intervention. So the only thing I could do is extrapolate using other countries' data when they're also under no intervention. But here I'm saying, well, you know what? We'll just do a bold, uh, uh, a bold, potentially stupid move where we'll use this relationship under under gray data to extrapolate green data. So are you gonna give us examples of what Y and Z are? What are the high dimensional uh, uh, yeah. features that you're, I mean, what is the high dimensional data that you have and uh, what is missing and so on? Yep. So again, in the context of COVID-19, uh, Y was simply uh, one dimensional data for United States, which was death count. Ah, okay. And Z was noisy death counts, sometimes missing values for all other countries. And this is simply time is simply daily. Okay, and all uh, the okay, I see. all the countries were aligned by day zero, but day zero were, uh, was defined for each country by their 80th death reporting. Okay, and when you do matrix estimation, so you make some assumption that this is some low rank matrix or something like that. Is that? Yeah. So at some level, uh, you could say that sort of implicitly we assume that matrix is a low rank and we simply computed the low, uh, low rank representation of the noisy matrix. Um, at least in, um, uh, in this case study, when we sort of plotted the matrix, it actually is amazingly low rank, like sort of okay. less than rank four. And uh, the singular values. Exactly, you just plot the spectrum of singular values and it just cuts itself off. And uh, in most case studies, a uh, few that I will represent here and the few that are not here, same story holds. Like all classical case studies that uh, Alberto Abadi in his original work represented, they also have same, it's like rank two or rank three turns out to be the best thing. Some of the case studies within the context of cricket, for example, again, it's like rank three is the best, uh, uh, it's good enough. So it's um, kind of uh, almost, it seems like a, Meta, um, meta theorem saying that most practical things must be low rank or approximately low rank. So which basically means there's a lot of linear relationship between the various uh, uh, countries that you're looking at, for example, in this context. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Yeah. So uh, when we look at different to these intervention mechanisms, the intervention mechanisms themselves are also uh, highly correlated, right? So can we use that or it's already been uh, utilized in, in our algorithm? So it's a brilliant question. So I think uh, if I may paraphrase your question, uh, what intervention is given to a country depends on the country itself. So in a sense, the observation pattern that we have is not, um, let's call it random, but it might have some uh, correlation with the intervention that it has received already. And hence the observation that we already have might have also correlation to what we're observing. So under what setting and in what form can that create an issue or not? Uh, and that's basically the confoundedness issue. So let me pause uh, on that question and go through the model that sort of uh, justifies some of these approaches and then sort of we can revisit that question. In a sense, uh, the model will sort of present conditions or uh, under which this kind of assumption is not an issue. Okay, sounds great, thanks. Thank you. Any other question? Okay. Go ahead, yeah. All right, so um, again, so now we want to understand why such a method uh, should work um, and when. So in a sense, if you want to sort of define some model class that allows or that gives us um, uh, at least understanding of why such approaches might have chances to work. So just to remind ourselves, this was our ground truth of interest. That is under all different countries, all across different times, across different policies, 
we want to know the data. And if we can do that, that will be fantastic. Okay, now we would argue that, or we would posit that this uh, tensor is a low rank tensor, low CP rank tensor in the sense that there are singular vectors associated with uh, units, the measurements or time in this case, and the intervention. And each entry is simply uh, represented by this rank R representation. And R is small constant compared to N, T, or D, okay? But basically R doesn't change, okay? So for example, in the simplest form, uh, let's say it's rank one, then the measurement associated with unit N at time T under intervention one is simply uh, multiplication of feature associated with latent, but feature associated with unit N, time T, and uh, uh, intervention one. If we go across interventions for the same unit and same time, of course, the features associated with unit and time remain the same, but intervention changes. If I go across, let's say, remain the same intervention, but change the time, then of course, the time feature changes. And if I keep these two things fixed, but I change the unit, then it's the unit intervention changes. Okay. All right. So uh, with that as the model, um, if you look at any of these slice as a matrix, of course, it has the same, uh, let's say, unit or effectively the left singular vectors, but its uh, representation in terms of the right vectors is changing. And in a sense, U, which is associated with units, describes the invariant relationship. So no matter which slice I take, the latent features associated with units remain the same. And it's uh, the relationship between these latent features is what we are capturing either in synthetic control or intervention through linear relationship. And that in a sense is the fundamental reason why the relationship captured across gray slice also holds in blue slice or green slice. And that's why model transfer is happening. The reason there is a linear relationship existing in the first place is because that's a low rank uh, structure, which means that the features are maybe rank R vectors, say R is two, but the number of uh, units are N, let's say 100. So of course, these vectors must be effectively linear, linearly depend, uh, dependent on each other. And hence, we must be able to find linear relationship between them. Okay. So this, in a nutshell, is gives you the intuition of why, uh, why such an approach might have a chance to work. Okay, um, here is just a little bit of uh, formalism saying that if indeed the uh, latent factor associated with unit one is a linear combination of latent factor associated with other units, then that remains true. The same linear relationship explains the relationship between observations or potential outcomes for unit one under any intervention with the other unit's uh, observation. That means linear relationship we learn in gray slice must go to green slice or blue slice. And that's why model transfer is okay. And that's also the reason why synthetic control and intervention exist and work. Okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> the another question that, um, uh, that was asked a minute back is, okay, so what about the relationship between the intervention that a unit has already received and the observations we see. So let's try to understand sort of under what sorts of setting this may, uh, this may uh, be okay to do. Okay, so here is a, a simple generative model that just explains the model that we explained. So let's imagine that sort of the, the latent unit time and intervention factors were generated as per some distribution. It could be just arbitrary deterministic, and that's also a distribution. Once you have those things, as per the, uh, the uh, sorry, as per the uh, low rank tensor model that we described, the potential outcome tensor is generated. So this is so far all the ground truth um, uh, and Oracle knows it, you and I don't know it. And then to each unit N, some treatment is assigned. 
Okay, some treatment is assigned post intervention or uh, okay, and that leads to what observations that we will see of this tensor. Okay, specifically noisy versions of them. Now, the setting in which it's okay to do what we are trying to do, that is synthetic control or intervention, one setting is where we, uh, what we call as latent unconfoundedness. That is the assignment. So every unit, let's say country United States, has some latent uh, features that determines both its outcomes as well as its, uh, the treatment it gets. However, condition on these uh, latent features or latent uh, factors, the outcomes and assignments are independent. So in, um, in a graphical model sense, so this is my latent features use. Condition on that, so D, the, the treatment that we assign to it, as well as the observation that we have, they're all uh, dependent on you, but condition on you, they're independent. So this condition independent would say that the causal parameter, for example, defined as this quantity, that is the average uh, uh, effect over time, but for a given unit, that could be well evaluated from observed data as long as we can learn this linear relationship approximately well and we are observing uh, data that's not too bad. Okay, so this is a one type of a condition under which the uh, dependency between assignment of the treatment as well as observation is okay. Okay, in COVID-19 setting, one could imagine that the treatment or the policy that was intervened in the United States did depend on the uh, certain latent characteristics of the United States. The outcome of the United States under any policy for that matter does depend on those latent characteristics too. However, once we fix those latent characteristics, condition on that, the outcome or noisy observations and the treatment that's assigned are independent conditionally. In that setting, of course, this type of method would provide you the, uh, the right answer as long as your um, uh, generalization error is not off. And it's something we'll discuss uh, statistically in a second. Okay, let me pause here. If there's a question about what sorts of um, unconfoundedness assumption that we are making here. I'm not sure if my question makes sense, it's not about the uncount, unconfoundedness, but I was wondering even early on, uh, you assume a linear relationship between Y and uh, Z, right? Mm -hmm. Are there examples, uh, at least in machine learning people used to use kernels to capture nonlinear, at least uh, the relationship between Y and X. So are there, um, I mean, I guess, I suppose one could use something like that even here too, depending on what type of data you have? Is that, is that common or people just simply assume linear most of the time in all of the examples you're aware of? It's a brilliant question. Uh, it's perfect question actually. Um, so for simplicity of presentation, I'm just keeping it precisely exactly linear. Uh, as you uh, correctly pointed out that maybe in general, one could say that, uh, and let's say not in tensor, but let's say matrix sense, uh, you might have U and y and t which in expectation might be some latent function f of uh, some theta n oh, actually let me not change the notation here uh, arbitrarily sorry about that um, uh, okay so that was too much of erasing but let's say y and t in expectation some function of U N and uh, I don't know what I had, maybe V T. Okay, and so far we assume that F is a bilinear function that is U transpose V, but uh, more generally it could be a reasonable uh, uh, Lipschitz continuous function with, for example, these guys coming from a compact space. Then this would be approximately low rank in the traditional sense, but with a larger uh, rank coming from the model class and so on and so forth. So naturally many of these things were nicely transported there with all sorts of approximation error and so on. Thanks. Okay. 
All right, so um, just proceeding further, um, more generally, if you had randomized control, then by design, the treatment assignment is independent of uh, uh, is independent of the outcomes that you have, and then there's no there's clearly uh, un, there's no confoundedness, and uh, then similar arguments would go through. So these are the few types of examples where um, where unconfoundedness is uh, is uh, useful to argue that this type of method would provide you the right answers uh, as far as parameter estimate or causal uh, inference is concerned. Now, as I mentioned, the last part, this one, um, sorry, this one's ability to say something useful about this one, that is, when is this true? This is effectively the question of generalization, that is, for the things that we have not observed. And so the question is that when can we do uh, a generalization in this kind of a model? But there is a, a nice, simple uh, linear algebraic relationship that we can discuss, where what it says is that here are the countries that we observed pre-intervention. Let's say U is their low rank um, uh, um, left singular vector or, or uh, subspace that represents that after matrix estimation. And U post is the same thing, but for observations for those countries under blue intervention. So for generalization, we must require that effectively span of U post must be within span of U pre. Now, this is necessary condition, not sufficient condition, but under this simple algebraic uh, necessary condition, the generalization works out and we can get nice sets of guarantees. Uh, it avoids the classical distributional assumption saying that if you want to do generalization in supervised learning, then you want to make sure that your future or test samples are coming from the same distribution. And here, actually, they're not coming because you see, pre-intervention, it was some distribution, post-intervention, it is some distribution. So this kind of structural property helps a lot. Okay. Um, and that's, uh, that's something that sort of you can use also to do certain testing, uh, as we'll discuss in a second. Okay. But in, in short, uh, it is this kind of a data-driven test that you apply to uh, first argue that when the model transfer can happen in terms of learning relationship in pre-intervention to forecast something in post-intervention. And we can also use this to say that, well, uh, this is my hypothesis. If this hypothesis is not uh, verified, then I will not um, um, trust the recommendations from these methods. And if it is, then maybe there is a hope that this might be true. Okay. And again, you can sort of do the data-driven version of it to come up with the right for a given, um, uh, uh, given let's say, p-value or, uh, or confidence of alpha. You come up with the value t of alpha that will say that uh, what the difference between this this type of test statistics to look like. Okay. And again, sort of under the model, you would hope that this scales like this. So there's a way to evaluate it, or you can do bootstrap, which would sort of give you the precise constant for a given setting. And then depending on whether the test statistics is greater than or less than, you would either reject or not. And again, when you're rejecting, you're really rejecting null hypothesis. You are not, um, uh, okay, so it's one-sided. So it's not like saying that so if you accept it, you should be completely uh, fully trusted, but at least it gives you some confidence. Okay. So under that uh, algebraic condition satisfying, what the counterfactual analysis or error would say that expected mean squared error scales like one over the number of samples that you have to learn the linear relationship, the rank of uh, or approximately rank of the pre-intervention data here. And uh, of course, the sort of the two norm of the model that you want to learn. What is rho here? Well, rho is um, simply the fraction of uh, observation that we might have observed here. Of course, if everything is observed, then rho is one. If not, then so rho is something between zero. Let me see if uh, there is any question on this, otherwise I'll move on to the uh, next set of things. 
So is beta star the true beta? Is that, is that what that means? Uh, that's correct. Thank you. So beta star is the true linear relationship that explains this with uh, linear relationship here. Now again, it's a low rank setting. So there may be multiple such beta stars. So the specific beta star, and again, I don't think time will permit for me to go there, but the one that you should think about is the one which is the minimum two norm beta star. Okay. That is among all possible linear relationship that can explain uh, this as a linear function of this after, uh, after uh, denoising, it's the one with minimum two norm. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. All right, just a quick comparison with the literature, and I think we've gone through this a uh, couple of times, is that uh, bottom line is there's a, with this, you can get sort of nice finite sample uh, guarantees. It works for both treatment and control, works for all units and multiple interventions. In that sense, it nicely extends the existing method of synthetic control. And uh, I think one nice thing that came out of this is simple algebraic um, hypothesis test with uh, one-sided uh, rigorous guarantee that tells us when to not use it. And interestingly, we went back and applied this test to some of the original um, synthetic control studies. And we found that in some of them, the test does not apply, suggesting that maybe one should not trust those things. And um, uh, uh, coincidentally, it turned out that those were the cases where people had uh, some of the intuitive doubts. So it's kind of a nice, uh, uh, a nice uh, confirmation. Okay, uh, one remark that I would like to make and sort of uh, suggest an important thing to think about as many of you are listening potentially in interest in machine learning uh, slash tensor estimation or causal inference or both or none for that matter. And maybe this is where hopefully you would find it really interesting is that if we transfer these questions into this uh, tensor estimation framework, now we have uh, lots of interesting things we can do, right? One is you can ask question, what sorts of sparsity allow you to recover? And of course, those sparsities have appropriate unconfoundedness assumption that we have to think about, but assuming those things are there, then question is what sorts of sparsities with what sorts of assumptions can we do causal inference in a meaningful manner? Uh, tensor estimation is not a straightforward problem. For example, there are nice computational and statistical trade-off. Um, in the traditional model in machine learning where one assumes that data is observed in a uniformly at random manner, uh, if you have three order tensor, let's say n by n by n, and you want to complete it well. Uh, statistically, order n samples are sufficient, but computationally efficient algorithms require order n raised to three by two samples. Okay. Um, now, this is with uniform sparsity. The block sparsity that came from uh, this policy evaluation setting looks something like this. And here, if we go back and do the analysis uh, carefully, then it turns out this is the number of samples we need. Okay. And complexities, of course, this is uh, ordinary least squares with uh, uh, principal component applied before. And so easy to bound in order and cube. Now, this is not a horse race. The way I want, I want you to think about this is now in this framework, at least now we can start a conversation about how do we think about computational and statistical trade-off for a causal inference that is a conversation that has not started yet. Second is, um, what sorts of different experimental design methods that we can do to achieve good, um, uh, uh, good, let's say, a counterfactual analysis. Um, it corresponds to different types of sparsity patterns. That's another thing to think about and discuss. And so I feel that sort of it opens up um, a, a set of questions that we have no answer, no answer or no proper understanding. And I hope that you would take that this sort of as a starting point for that. Okay, so with that as a um, uh, method of synthetic intervention and a few quick remarks about why or what models will, will make it uh, work. Now what I want to do is I want to look at a different type of case studies, not just policy evaluation style, but how can we make the traditional uh, randomized control personalized and in a data efficient manner. So before I move forward, any questions? 
Hey, Darren, uh, I have a question. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so for this uh, result, you mentioned like try to predict the uh, US uh, uh, with other countries' data. Uh, have you looked at like or uh, use other states to predict one state's uh, behavior under under synthetic uh, intervention? Because even US, different states are doing different things. Fantastic question. So, um, uh, paraphrasing your question a little bit, is it possible to take this method and apply different um, granularity? And uh, potentially one of the hidden questions that you might have behind it is that well, at state level, countries are geographically apart, so maybe they may not interact well as much, but maybe states are close to each other and hence they might interact. Because there might be um, um, uh, what in causal inference world, what people call SUTI, CTVA, is like that might be violated. So that's a fair, um, First of all, SUTWA violation, in a sense, one assumes some kind of a SUTWA, that is there's no interaction between countries beyond their factors. So that's one thing. Coming back to empirically applying it, we applied this to the um, uh, setup of uh, India as we were trying to help uh, evaluate some of the policy evaluation uh, for different states under um, different policies. And there, what we found is that at least in India, in uh, early days, at least in the first month, it was reasonably effective in the same manner. That is, you can do at least some kind of uh, cross-validation and hypothesis test. Uh, we have not done a detailed study within the United States, though. And I think it will be uh, very good if, uh, if somebody on the, let's say, call takes my and does it. OK, thanks. Devra, this is Madhavi. This is really cool. Just one point, uh, we actually did a similar study in our archive paper. We didn't, we don't have the, the mathematical machinery to go with it. Um, for political reasons, we actually went ahead in time rather than saying what would have happened if we had improved uh -huh. with the back. And you can imagine why one would do it. Uh, but uh, because you raised this question and I think uh, your colleague asked this, we have Google mobility data, which with which we are working with. So it's very nice collection of data sets across countries and within states as well. And we can all talk about it later on. But I just wanted to bring it to everybody's attention. Absolutely. So I think, Madho, one thing I would uh, request, maybe if you could post that in LinkedIn chat, maybe then sort of some of us can at least look at it. And yeah. um, I should have mentioned that the mobility data that I'm talking about here is exactly what Madho pointed out, is the Google mobility data. And the, that data is exactly what we're using from, say, New York Times and GHU repository. Thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, any other question? Right. If not, what I'll do is that I will spend uh, remaining uh, 18 minutes or so, or maybe 15 minutes or so, going through two simple case studies uh, making this point. And this is where another. Um, opportunity I will get to connect to this uh, workshop in at least personnel manner, and I'll make that obvious in a second. So uh, what is the question of interest? So let's suppose we go back to the classical randomized control setting, okay? And we've got different patient types, especially as we think about um, treating patients in the context of cancer, there are, even for a given cancer, there are the patients with different markers that come. So there's a lot of different patient types, there are different drugs that are out there and over time we may measure their health, uh, let's say measurement of interest uh, for these patients. And the question is that for a given patient, which treatment is the best? Okay, so ideally what I would like to do is that for a given patient group, I would like um, for each of these patient groups, let's say I've got N of these, for each of them, I would like to give uh, for one small group uh, treatment one, another group treatment two and so on like there's n times number of experiments that uh, number of treatment experiments I would like to do. Now, on one hand, it's costly, of course. Uh, also, there are ethical concerns. Uh, and even if you don't have any of these concerns, this requires a lot more patients, at least d times more patients than otherwise to do these experiments. And in the case of cancer, it's very, very hard. Uh, same with Alzheimer's and all that. So that's why what people usually do is randomized control where, where they don't personalize, but what they would do is that patients get um, treatment across all of them. And then there is one treatment 
that's given to all the patients. Okay, so this is an ideal experiment under which we might say that for this patient type, this is the best treatment, and for this patient type, that is this one, this is the best treatment and so on, that's idealized. But here, all the patients averaged over them, we get sort of one treatment. Okay. So the question is that, uh, how can we go from uh, RCT to this ideal setting by, first of all, going that reduces feasibility, but increases personalization. So it would be best if we could get uh, best of both worlds or close to that. That is, try to get, um, as much data efficiency here and personalization here. And we could use synthetic intervention to achieve such personalization with two times what we do here, okay? independent of D. Okay, so how do we do that? Uh, and I'd like to explain this through two examples. Okay, so first is a case study from development economics. And this is a, uh, based on this uh, amazing uh, real experiment uh, on the ground done over years by Abhijit Banerjee, Esther Dufto, two of my colleagues, as well as Matt Jackson and their collaborators. Matt is one of the speakers in the workshop. So that's another connection of this talk to the workshop, if nothing else. Uh, the, what they did is the following. They, uh, in collaboration with um, uh, um, government of Haryana in India. So Haryana is a state in India. For 2,500 or so villages, they wanted to understand which intervention would increase uh, the immunization for young kids by most. Okay, now in a sense, it's a, it is a real problem. And the type of interventions that they were thinking about were if you, if you as a mother, young mother, bring your child for immunization, you might get some money. Or you as a mother, if your cell phone is registered, we will send you SMS reminders. Or if you are part of a village and there is a, there is a head of a village, then we would tell head of the village to go and tell uh, young mothers to go and do that. Or maybe we'll just choose a random person like a barber or, uh, or somebody selling vegetables to go and do that. Okay. So either through influencing through people influencing through money or influencing through reminder or combination of thereof. And they divided, they devised roughly 75 intervention with one being do nothing. Okay. And they want to know which one is the best. And they observed the outcomes over 13 month period. And this is a painstakingly amazing field trial because it was done over 2,500 or so villages. Now, of course, each village can get exactly one intervention, not more. And question is that what would be the best intervention for each village? Ideally, we would have liked to do all the intervention for all the villages, but observationally and reality, we can only do one intervention for one village. So it's exactly the setting that we were discussing uh, here. That is, we are in the setting of RCT style setting, but we want to have inference of personalized RCT. So uh, applying the synthetic intervention to this setting, not with single observation, but with multiple observations, and I won't go into those details, but it just um, by viewing instead of this as three order tensor, but high order tensor, that's one way to do that. Uh, what we found is the following. First of all, these are the encodings for different types of intervention. Okay. Uh, under them, for we went to the villages and tried to do the hypothesis test that we had in the data-driven manner. And for most, we found that we could uh, satisfy hypothesis. For this one, we cannot, so we had to reject, so we can't trust outcomes there. And the way we measured error is as follows. Let's suppose that you're a village and you are getting treatment as per uh, synthetic intervention-based uh, outcome. Or let's say you are a village and you're going to get recommendation based on the randomized control trial, aggregated. And what would be the prediction error? And uh, these, and then sort of you use them as a to device R square. So if R square is one, that's the, hopefully you overcome all the limitations of RCT with respect to ground truth. Uh, if R square is zero, that means that your method has not really helped over randomized control trial that was before. It's a population level. 
And as you can see, for example, things like this suggesting that, well, indeed, by using uh, personalization, actually you are able to predict much better the ground truth than just RCT or population average uh, prediction. Uh, it's interesting to see that sort of places where we fail, also our sort of method has a, a poorer estimation or poorer performance. Okay. All right, so um, maybe this is the first case study and uh, if there is any question, I'm happy to take them here. I'll move on to the next one. Right, looks like there's no more question. Um, moving on, um, just to sort of uh, conclude, uh, what was the impact of uh, this in the context of uh, how much improvement would have happened by doing, let's say, synthetic interventions, personalized policy um, recommendation as per the our uh, forecast, so to speak. Uh, it would improve by 2.8 times over what a random policy uh, recommendation would be compared to the best RCT would have improved only 1.3 times over random policy. So assuming our method is correct and the model is reasonable fit, then this seems like a significant improvement that one would get. Okay, now one thing that sort of here, uh, as I'm sort of speaking, I'm always being um, cautious because I don't know the ground truth. So the question is that, is that a sort of setting that we could have had a ground truth and then sort of see if uh, synthetic intervention helps. And this is a setting that we did for, uh, we had data for large e-commerce company in India. So roughly speaking, here is what the setting was. There are 25 user groups that you, they have. Each user group has more than 10K users. There are three different types of um, uh, discounts uh, that, that can be given. So 10% discount, 30% discount, 50% discount, and control is no discount. And then we measured customer engagement uh, over eight days. Okay. So eight is the number of observations, four different interventions, and 25 different users. Okay. And for each of these things, we observed all the data. So now we have a ground truth. And then sort of what we can do is we can actually do the usual cross validation that is take out some of these and then sort of present it to synthetic intervention and then ask it to fill it. Okay, so again, it's the same thing as before. Um, can we do what ideal RCT would do but with actual RCT like data? Okay, so just to put it in a, a picture, we got eight groups here, eight groups here and eight groups here and uh, I'm doing this grouping for visual ease and there are four interventions. And in each of these cell, in fact, I've got eight times eight numbers because for eight days, so I've got all of those data available. And then um, what we would do for synthetic intervention is only present it data in these cells and ask it to fill in these things. So again, the way to think about it is that for each group, synthetic intervention sees uh, effect under control and effect under one intervention only. So every group has, uh, every group's outcome under control is observed by the method and then intervention only one of them. Just like very much sort of the setting block sparsity setting that we have seen before. And with this, we want to sort of fill up everything else. Okay, and again, so we run the hypothesis test with uh, uh, 5% um, confidence and uh, in this case, all of them pass, so hopefully we can trust them. As before, this is, um, this is effectiveness of synthetic intervention with respect to the randomized control, uh, population level randomized control um, recommendation, and this is with respect to true uh, regression in the true R square sense. That is, we look at the observation and then true mean and then sort of uh, look at that as a variance and then try to sort of do the predictions. And here is what we find for, again, this is averaged over uh, all groups for each of these interventions in the pattern you observed, that these are the true R squares that we are getting and these are the gains with respect to the RCT. So as you can see, 
RCT is um, is definitely missing out on the heterogeneity of the uh, uh, the groups, and most of the missed out heterogeneity is overcome by our method with respect to RCT. And with respect to true thing, this is a reasonably good R squared. So again, in this case, we actually had uh, uh, true observations. So there is a confidence that we know that sort of actually we could do what uh, the method promises to do. All right, so I think I'm getting closer to the end of the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, I've got seven more minutes, and I had one additional um, um, additional section plan, but I think I won't do it. Instead, I will just make a quick remark that the key uh, methodical uh, or uh, statistically what one has to argue is that one has to go back to the error in variable regression setting and analyze principal component regression. And um, um, as a byproduct, what this does is that this provides a method. Uh, so there's for error in variable regression in the high dimensional setting lately, there's been a beautiful development uh, starting with convex relaxation based approaches such as uh, one by Lou and Wainwright uh, that expands for lasso. The problem is that it requires knowledge of noise. Uh, principal component regression, as we discussed, does not require any knowledge of noise. And it achieves the, the parametric rate, as one would call it. Uh, and the one, the solution that works best is the one which is the minimum uh, norm solution consistent with the data, which is the ordinary least square, which is given by PCR. Okay, so with that, I'm going to skip all of that and simply conclude that I think sort of uh, looking at causal inference questions from tensor estimation perspective uh, leads to the synthetic intervention, a bunch of things we discussed, but I, I'm hoping that it will be a good um, sandbox for uh, some of us who look at questions from machine learning perspective and going looking at causal inference or folks looking at causal inference and coming to machine learning. This might be a good ground to meet and discuss a variety of uh, uh, interesting challenges that arise from computational view, causal inference view, and statistical view. I think with that, let me pause and uh, take questions. Thank you, Deva Bharat. That was a fantastic talk. It was a, a really great methodology that uh, at least I learned a lot from. Uh, uh, so I have one, let me start off with one quick question. So I've seen, I think the Economist maybe first published this and then maybe New York Times picked up on it, which is, so there are people who are skeptical about COVID-19 death counts and so on. And so, so what they did was they looked at the number of deaths last year in each state. And then, and then they talked, you know, and they said that this is this year we've had so many deaths. And so this is the uh, uh, amount of increase. And this shows that there is, uh, uh, um, you know, something going on, which I think is a great way to explain, uh, uh, even if you don't believe that doctors are reporting it correctly and so on. So it seems like, if I understand correctly, synthetic intervention and synthetic control sort of goes one step further and you're not just looking at every state individually, but you're trying to understand what is happening in other states and they're trying to use a regression model and then and then using it to predict what is happening in a particular state. So have, have you had a chance to compare what these things, just comparing last year's to this year's for a particular state versus how can you take into account other states' behavior and also sort of use that in the prediction? Does that provide significant differences or not? Or So I think this is... <laughs> Brilliant question. So let me sort of parse it in a few steps. One is, um, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, but I think uh, it's the right paraphrasing, is that um, we have observations from past and we have observations now. Now, that means that there is some information within time as well, rather than just space. Mm -hmm. And the presentation here was simply about um, relationship within space rather than relation across time. For example, if, um, if we had, uh, let's say, uh, some reasonable temporal model, say this was my time when intervention happened and the world was going like this. And then if I had a reasonable forecasting model, it would be like this, but actually maybe the that now looks like this, right? And maybe this difference explains uh, that something has happened. And um, that is not, as we discussed, is, uh, uh, incorporated in the model itself because we are simply looking at the data in space. So if we incorporate things in time, potentially this is a sort of an, uh, along with the model that we looked at, 
than naturally one could think about. So one of the things that uh, some of us as a group are trying to understand, and there are many other approaches already in literature, uh, like going back to our classical, let's say, it is your and maybe mine, classical roots of control, like this is kind of a, if we assume that there's no intervention, then this is uh, like a LTI or linear recurrent formula like setting. Right. So what if we wanted to bring that as a part of this model? So going back into the tensor factor model, this VT that we have as a factor, maybe the VT as a time series or as a time structure has some such a model of evolution. And then that might help us understand and create a hypothesis test saying that whether this deviation is simply a, a noise or actually a serious model change. That's a, that's a broader answer then. That's great, actually. That's, that's, you actually ex even asked my question better and answered it good. <laughs> uh, any other questions? So are there, in terms of data sets that you mentioned in your talk, are any of these data sets are public available? Like if one to follow up and doing something, or will they have access to the data set? Absolutely. So I think um, um, in the talk, uh, we discussed uh, three, uh, three case studies. First one was COVID. I didn't sort of formally spend time explaining uh, any of the data, but uh, the two data sets that are used there, one is the Google mobility data and um, uh, the death count of the country. And um, uh, the Google mobility is of course from them. And then the death count we used uh, effectively the GHU's repository. Now, um, one of the nice things that would be that I think we want to do, and maybe others also, uh, is put together sort of a clean, let's say, a Python notebook so that how did we process the data and produce these numbers? That's something that um, uh, we are in the process of doing. Uh, but at least highest level, those data sets are publicly available. Coming to the case study of Benerji et al., um, I do believe, and I think a question worth asking to our one of the speakers, Matt, uh, not necessarily his talk will be on this topic, but uh, he's one of the uh, co-authors of that work. Uh, that data set we obtained from them, and I do believe that they plan to make it public soon. It's a remarkable case study, and I think as a community, everybody would benefit a lot. As far as the third data set is concerned, uh, that is something that sort of we obtained from uh, from, uh, uh, from a company that sort of um, uh, I know well in India and we are in the process of trying to figure out how we can make it public. Thanks. 